Uh, thank you very much. So yes, my name is Emma Thompson. I'm based at the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research, which is in this building here, situated in the parks in, in Glasgow, um, and also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and I, I'm a clinical clinician and uh, a clinician scientist, I guess. And um, the work that I'm going to present today, it relates largely to the COG UK Consortium or COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium, which uh, was started um, around March 2020 in the UK with a, a fairly substantial investment from Wellcome, um, the uh, UKRI and the UK government uh, to allow us to track um, the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 in the UK as it emerged. And um, uh, this was set up to really address a variety of different things. And uh, I think the aims of COG UK have evolved over the last two years. But um, at the outset, we wanted to do things like um, investigate transmission growth rates, introductions into um, the UK, uh, rates of growth, uh, we wanted to identify genomic changes that might, well, we, I ca can't say that we uh, <laughs> set out at the beginning to identify genomic changes that might affect vaccine efficacy, but that has become a, a really important aim for us now, uh, having um, seen the rollout of vaccines. And then uh, changes that might affect emerging treatments, diagnostic tests, um, and disease severity. And I, I'm probably going to concentrate most on the vaccine effectiveness um, and some of the biology um, and the changes in biology that we've seen that are associated with changes in the genome. So some geno genotype to phenotype work that we've done, particularly with the Omicron uh, variant. So um, sequencing really now has become part of a sort of early warning system in the UK. We work very closely with the uh, public health authorities. Um, so that, that's uh, the UK Health Security Agency or UXA um, and the Public Health Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And um, I, I thought I'd go through some of the history of what we've learned from the sequencing, um, what, what it, it brought to us perhaps unexpectedly. And I think when we set out uh, we realized that there was a certain amount of risk in, in doing so much sequencing. We've sequenced well over 2 million um, genomes in the UK. And um, there, was, there was certainly quite a bit of skepticism about how valuable that um, project was going to be. Um, although I think that that's largely been overcome now. Um, so at the very beginning of the outbreak, we looked at introductions of the virus into the country. And at the time, unfortunately, our public health services were rather overwhelmed and were finding it difficult to track every single infection and look at contacts and so on. So it was actually quite difficult to um, estimate growth rates. And so we did that uh, with um, the, the phylogeny and we, we used the kind of phylogenetic changes that were evolving at the time very slowly or around about two uh, nucleotide changes in the genome per month, so really very slowly at the very beginning of this um, pandemic. But we used that and we calibrated it with um, linked data from the public health agencies, which told us where people uh, might have um, traveled to and so on. And so we were able to estimate, calibrate the, the rate of evolution of the virus uh, and um, with what we knew about what was emerging in other countries and so on, we were able to estimate that the virus actually entered the UK more than a thousand times in the first month of the um, outbreak, uh, which uh, started in February 2020 in England and uh, March in, in Scotland. And um, we looked at this in a couple of different ways, um, but it, it was very closely related to travel uh, international travel routes and most of these uh, infections are actually imported from Central Europe and um, not from um, directly from from China or, or other countries. This was uh, how things looked in Scotland and so we we watched very carefully um, the emergence of cases uh, across Scotland uh, in the first month of the outbreak and uh, these are if, if you see on the y-axis these are different weeks so one two three four and then different days of the week and um, our initial cases were imported from Italy as shown in green here but very rapidly we had evidence of community transmission and 
um, by the third and fourth week, we knew that um, most of the cases that we were seeing were not were no longer imported, um, and that there was uh, that there was very high rate um, sustained transmission in community. Um, and then, um, interestingly, so after the first wave in in Scotland, and things are slightly diff done slightly differently in Scotland um, because we have a different health service from England, but it, it's kind of joined up and linked. Um, but we have had slightly different rules and regulations as, as the pandemic has emerged. Um, after the first uh, wave of infection, there was a lockdown and uh, we, we looked at the number of lineages that we were uh, seeing in Scotland. Um, and in, in the first uh, wave, which is reflected here, and then in the lower panel, um, these are different lineages and the <clears throat> intensity of color indicates which ones were most um, dominant. So the, the sort of deep purple lineages here um, were the ones which were um, <clears throat> most frequently found, but there were many uh, across the country. And then there was a lockdown. And then what you can see is that most of those lineages actually became extinct and that the majority of infections in the second wave, which you can see in the, the upper panel here and then in the lower panel, uh, here, most of these were actually re-imported. Re and so um, there were very few extant lineages from the first um, wave of infection. And so this really highlighted for us how important it was that we were importing a lot of, of um, SARS-CoV-2 and it resulted in some changes in the, the travel sort of restrictions in the UK um, for better or for worse. And I guess that's something maybe worth discussing at some point, but uh, um, uh, we probably did that too late and we were aware of this happening very early, but um, the response to it was, was a bit delayed. We also used um, the sequencing to look at uh, outbreaks in hospitals. And um, this was a, a, a sort of deep look at what was going on in renal dialysis units in Scotland. And uh, unfortunately we had uh, a lot of um, outbreaks in our dialysis units and uh, because they really sort of represent a conduit between the community and the hospital environment uh, because people dialyze for four hours or so three times a week and um, we were able to again join up some of the clinical data with the genomic data to try to estimate how often um, infections were being transmitted in hospitals versus in the community and uh, in fact we we um, we brought in a system to link in uh, zip codes from where people were living and then look at uh, the sort of background prevalence of different variants in the hospital. And we are able to uh, estimate the likelihood of an infection having been acquired in the hospital versus uh, outside the community. And what you can see here on this panel, so for example, if you look at this cluster here, UK429, you can see that there were a lot of phylogenetically linked um, uh, sequences here from different people. And um, that uh, the very first time that this was detected indicated by this little black dot here, uh, that was not likely to have been a hospital onset infection, but uh, all the others, and you can see them sort of uh, joining up uh, sequentially um, over time, were likely to have been exposed to this index case. And um, the, the, the likelihood of, uh, we, we estimated through a variety of, sort of modeling methods that was led by Oliver Stirrup from um, UCL, uh, it, that this person was most likely infected in the unit itself. And the second figure is actually the likelihood of having been infected in the rest of the hospital. And, and in fact, these, um, these uh, lineages were not like other lineages in the hospital, but were very much like the lineage seen in the dialysis unit, indicating um, transmission at a local level in that unit. Um, however, sometimes what we saw, if you look at the top here, UK40, we saw what looked like very closely related, phylogenetically related sequences, but it was much harder to say that those had been acquired from within the hospital uh, because there were many other uh, similar sequences summarized here as 63 in the community where uh, many of these um, um, patients came from. And so it was, it was actually much less obvious that they were infected in the hospital. And so we tried to uh, use a mixture of genomics and clinical data to, to figure out how commonly we were seeing um, transmission in our hospitals. And it was a, quite a mixed picture. So sometimes there were very clearly outbreaks that did look like they were associated with infection, most often from patient to patient rather than from staff to patient. 
um, or a patient to staff, but we, we, we saw that happening as well. Um, and we instituted this really within the hospital system so that these calculations could be made uh, in real time and shared with infection control colleagues. And then um, one of the other major aims of this work has been to look for evidence of immune evasion. And of course, we were in the UK, the first to see a new variant, which arose in the southeast of, of the UK in Kent and um, became dominant worldwide. But we've seen a, a very large number of, of variants since then, um, the most immune evading of which, of course, is Omicron. And I'll talk quite a bit about the work that we've been doing on Omicron at the CVR shortly. Um, the first uh, things that we did notice, however, when we were uh, tracking the, the virus, uh, as I mentioned, the evolution rate was actually quite slow at the time, um, pre-alpha. And we saw some polymorphisms that seemed to be associated with uh, initially an, an increase in growth rate. So the D614G um, mutation uh, was associated with uh, an increase in growth rate uh, as it emerged in the UK and, and across the rest of the world. And um, that work was done by Eric Foltz at Imperial College. Uh, we, we looked actually at linked clinical data with the emergence of that mutation and we didn't find any associated clinical uh, risk. However, we later uh, noticed a, a mutation, a single polymorphism called N439K, which uh, arose in Scotland uh, initially. And if you, if you remember what I showed before, the sort of impact of lockdown and the loss of certain uh, lineages, this was a lineage that emerged in Scotland but disappeared. However, after the lockdown, um, it re-emerged and it actually re-emerged in Central Europe and uh, then spread back into the UK again. And it, it was uh, present in uh, many countries uh, for, for a fair amount of time. Um, and that was really, I think, I think this was one of the first escape variants that, that you know, we demonstrated that it definitely looked like it was associated with evasion of the antibody mediated response. Um, it was also associated with the formation of a new salt bridge between the ACE2 receptor um, and the receptor binding domain of the virus, increasing the, the binding affinity of the virus um, to the receptor and making um, uh, and also resulting in evasion of monoclonal antibody and polyclonal antibody responses. And this is how it, it looked um, initially in the phylogeny. So that very first uh, lineage that emerged but disappeared post lockdown, we were actually a little bit relieved to see it disappearing. But then we saw the re-emergence in a completely different lineage of this N439K variant. And I think just to say that this was probably the first time that we really realized that we needed to be looking for evidence of convergent evolution of variants um, of, of mutations which might uh, confer immune evasion characteristics or, or other characteristics um, uh, on, on the virus. And as I said, it became quite dominant, for example, in the Republic of Ireland and also Denmark. Um, we, we like to identify, look into the phenotype of, of um, viruses that we find uh, um, genotypic changes in. And so this N439K variant we were able to show was associated with higher viral loads and lower CT values, and um, also seemed to have a kind of slightly higher takeoff in, in cell culture. And when we did cross-competition assays with next generation sequencing as an output, it was at least as fit as the wild type um, virus. It, didn't, it wasn't associated with uh, clinical severity. And we set up at this time a way of monitoring whether or not variants were having an effect on people's um, the severity of illness, so from requiring no support to requiring oxygen and hospital ventilation, either in invasive or non-invasive ventilation, um, or, or dying from the virus. Um, and uh, we later showed that uh, N439K was associated with, with evasion of uh, uh, polyclonal antibodies, um, which were raised against natural infection. At that time, we didn't have uh, vaccines. And it also seemed to reduce binding um, by one of the Regeneron antibodies as well. So this really heralded perhaps um, what has become uh, more relevant now to us, which is uh, was the stepwise change in evolution of uh, the emergence of new variants. And we followed these one by one, and in each one of them has uh, shown an increase in, in, or a reduction in neutralization when tested in vitro in the lab, either with live virus or with pseudovirus systems and a, a general increase in um, 
changes in the spike protein. So you can see the evolution of some of these um, more important variants over time. Uh, between alpha and Omicron, you can see that there, there's just been a very huge um, increase in the number of mutations in the um, spike protein. And um, around half of those, around 15 or so of those mutations were familiar to us from previous work and we knew we were likely to be associated with um, immune evasion, but uh, the other half we didn't really understand. And I can come on to uh, what the function of some of those might be a bit later. Um, we, we then looked at uh, Omicron in lots of detail, and this paper is uh, it's in press in Nature and Microbiology at the moment. Um, it's also in preprint, but not with the updated figures, which I'll show you now. Um, so we um, first uh, looked at people who'd received deployed vaccines and showed a very substantial drop in, and we and others, many others have shown this as well, um, uh, substantial drops in neutralization of uh, Omicron variants, BA1 and BA2. And um, a, a third dose of vaccine, which was rolled out quite early in the UK, did seem to help to restore some of the neutralization response. Um, and you can see that that was much more marked with a Wuhan type, or I should probably refer to a B1 lineage, um, compared with uh, the other lineages, but there was an overall slight increase in, in neutralization. Um, there would seem to be also, there is a very marked, um, uh, that, so um, Omicron really and, and Ronapri, there, there is really a, a, a very flat neutralize, neutralization. Um, BA2 with citrovimab seems to be a little bit less um, uh, susceptible to uh, citrovimab and um, um, this is important because citrovimab is used very widely at the moment in people who are more susceptible. Um, so I think there's a sort of accumulating evidence now from various groups that uh, BA2 is unfortunately a little bit more resistant to um, uh, citrovimab than uh, BA1 was. There doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, effect uh, on the T cell epitopes. And so um, around 28% of uh, the changes that we've seen across the genome are within known T cell epitopes. And really we haven't seen much uh, of, a, of a loss of um, T cell or uh, effect. And uh, so there's really not a lot of um, evasion of T cell immunity. Uh, it's all really about um, B cell evasion. Uh, and then, um, in, so we screened with neutralization and we do that, you know, having the early warning system of sequencing and change the sequencing. And then we tend to make pseudoviruses or we culture virus and, and look in the laboratory. But also we've been monitoring vaccine effectiveness in Scotland um, to different doses of vaccine. Um, and um, uh, we've looked at cases of infection. And then we've also looked at the clinical severity of infection in people who've been vaccinated. And, um, I guess uh, this is just the rollout of different vaccines in, in Scotland um, between 2021 and 2022. And we had slightly different rollouts of this is the first dose of vaccine, second dose, and then third dose uh, vaccines were given starting around October 2021. Um, and then in the right hand panel here, you can see um, the, the evolution of different variants that have been seen in the population. Uh, in people who've got different doses of different types of vaccine from the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, Chadox-1, which was used in around half the population, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, which was used in the other half. And uh, we used mRNA vaccines as third doses, um, either Pfizer or Moderna. And um, we looked, this is really the key slide of, of this collection of, of um, data on vaccine effectiveness. So uh, we found that people who had never been infected before, once they got to third dose vaccines, um, there was a very substantial drop in vaccine effectiveness when you look at uh, test positivity as the outcome. Uh, Delta is shown in green here and Omicron in, in orange, and this is BA1 data. Uh, and then, um, Interestingly, people who've also been infected and had three doses of vaccine have a much higher immune barrier to um, test positivity, which is, I think, quite interesting and important for what we might expect coming in the future. Uh, we've looked very carefully at clinical severity associated with disease. I've brought it up a couple of times, and um, we have this paper under review at the moment and out in preprint. 
but uh, um, you can see that the case severity uh, as we switch from one variant to another has been really heterogeneous. And so uh, in the UK, B1177 came in um, probably from Spain and then was taken over by Alpha. We noted an increase in severity of illness uh, in it, during the time of that switch. And um, uh, you can see here, you've got different age groups along the x-axis, so um, really severe illness uh, in people over the age of 60 uh, over time. And then um, you can see with the switch from alpha to delta, again, there was an increase in clinical severity of disease. So although severity was lower at this point, um, reflecting a real improvement in treatments that were available, uh, still, unfortunately, delta was more severe than alpha. And then we looked at delta to AY 4.2, which was delta plus as seen in the UK and didn't find any significant difference in, in uh, clinical severity of disease. And finally, when I guess we all saw the Omicron variant, uh, BA1, and all the changes in the genome, I think we all became very alarmed by that and the, the growth rate of that variant. And um, we realized as well that it, because we were very familiar with many of those changes, that it was very likely to evade immunity. Um, but we were very pleasantly surprised, and I think we really got quite lucky with this, that the clinical severity of illness was much, much lower with Omicron. Not insignificant, of course, particularly in older people, but uh, much lower than, than Delta. And we think we know why that might be. And, and so if I just have a minute or two for another slide or two, um, I'll show you what we've learned about Omicron. Um, so one of the things that we first noticed with Omicron was that it wasn't forming, uh, it wasn't adhering cell to cell in the same way as um, Delta does. And so you can see here, Syncytia formation, um, this is a split GFP system, so uh, when cells expressing GFP, this, this uh, partial protein and this other partial protein, when they adhere together, you get fluorescence um, as a result of the um, formation of a full GFP protein. And uh, with Delta, you can see pretty clearly there's a lot of cell to cell fusion, but with Omicron, that's not the case. And again, you can see that in a different way here on this um, fluorescence plot. Um, we also find that Omicron um, grows less well in lung cells. So these are Kalu cells, um, which um, are lung cancer cell line. And we were able to show that the growth in vitro of um, the Omicron BA1 variant, and we've also found the same with BA2 actually, um, is, is um, an order of magnitude at least lower than uh, Delta. And um, we wondered if this might relate to its route of entry, and indeed it does relate to its route of entry. So uh, all variants preceding Omicron get into cells directly through interacting with TMPRSS2 surface um, protein, uh, protease on the, on the surface of um, cells. Uh, this can be inhibited by camostat. And, uh, but Omicron actually gets in through endocytosis, and this looks a lot more like other coronaviruses, um, uh, including pangolin uh, coronavirus, which we use as a control. Um, and that can be inhibited by E64D. And so what we find was that Omicron actually grows less well in Calus 3 cells, which is a lung cell line, as I mentioned, but much better in, in HE K cells, which support an, an endosomal route of entry. Um, and it's about the same in, in A549s, which uh, support both routes of entry. We were able to show that this can be inhibited by the inhibitors that I've um, described already, and that this, perhaps if you look at panel H here, you can see that that was in a dose-dependent manner. So um, it is possible to uh, inhibit this uh, route of entry with the Omicron variant, both BA1 and BA2. And you can also see that there's a difference in um, the breakdown products that you would expect to see in, in uh, different cell types. And uh, uh, so really, in summary, this data, these data show us that um, Omicron is getting into cells in a completely different way via endocytosis. And I suspect that this may well uh, be part of the reason why you see a difference in cell tropism. Um, so we know, for example, that uh, lung cells, uh, they express a lot of TMPRSS2. Yeah, two, two minutes, two minutes. Emma. Yeah, I'm, that's great, that's good timing. Whereas, um, uh, whereas um, primary nasal epithelial cells uh, are, are more likely to support the, the endosomal entry route. Um, and uh, we, just since I've got two minutes, I'll just skip that one and go to this, this last slide. So uh, we've started to map down which, uh, which 
are the determinants of this change in entry. And so we made chimeric um, spike um, pseudopharises and we replaced uh, the Wuhan backbone with um, the NTD from Omicron, the receptor binding domain from Omicron and the S2 segment from Omicron. And basically what we found was that the um, S2, the replacement of the S2 segment uh, is what determines this entry by endocytosis. And so while um, coming back to using sequencing as an early warning sort of signal for uh, how a virus might behave. We didn't really understand uh, when we first saw the Omicron variant what that was going to mean in terms of clinical, clinical severity. I think I would get very worried about a virus that might have a Delta-like S2 um, domain. And of course, this is becoming increasingly important because we're starting to see the circulation of recombinant viruses um, all around the world and uh, there, there are several which are under kind of enhanced um, uh, monitoring at the moment, uh, one of which is XD which uh, has been, so one of the ones that we're interested in Europe is the XD uh, recombinant which has been detected in France and uh, is a Delta backbone with an Omicron spike. I, I might be a bit more worried about the other way around or a Delta S2 um, but uh, uh, these recombinants are, are definitely going to be important to to look out for. In the UK, we're now seeing more BA1, BA2 recombinants um, than, than Delta BA1 because uh, we, we're now really have BA2 dominance um, and that has taken over from, from BA1. So I, I'll finish there, uh, hopefully on time. Um, so genomic sequencing can be used as an early warning system, as I've mentioned, to estimate things like growth rates and introductions into the country, but also uh, immune evasion of um, new variants as they emerge and I think linked data is really critical and really important and we put a lot of effort into trying to link up um, our NHS systems with genomic data to allow us to understand how variants were associating with clinical severity of illness and vaccine effectiveness and um, a change in the cell entry really fundamental change in the cell entry of the Omicron variant was definitely not predicted through our surveillance program but uh, could now potentially be predicted in future variants uh, looking at the S2 domain. And I'll stop there, thanks so much. This is a lot of work uh, from many people who I'm um, representing and we've had funding as shown. Uh, these are some of the people who contributed to this work, thanks. Well, thank you, Emma, for a really uh, outstanding talk. Uh, for the uh, people who are uh, on Zoom, you can either use the raise hand function or type questions into the Q&A. I'm going to start out just with a couple of questions. One is uh, just in terms of the methodology, you probably said this, but I might have missed it, but how did you choose who, who was getting sequenced and what kind of uh, representative coverage do you think you have? Yeah, uh, I didn't. Sorry, I should have. Um, <laughs> we, we divided that into, so we did random sampling for half of the patient, half of the samples, and then half was... Um, was available to us to use at the local level to investigate outbreaks and so on. Um, but we, we were able to incorporate whether these were randomized samples or outbreak samples uh, into our thinking. And is there a correlation between uh, antibody uh, evasion and clinical severity? And I guess I would ask the same thing for T cell evasion. Okay, um, so, well, we certainly know that people that don't have effective antibody responses are much more at risk of severe disease. Um, however, I don't think that you can link them um, always. And I think that we were surprised to see that, that, that it wasn't linked with the Omicron variant really. Um, so we're seeing an awful lot of immune evasion, obviously, and many more infections but a, a much lower uh, clinical severity of illness. So it's a sort of mixed, it's a mixed picture. I guess if you don't have any immunity though, uh, you, you're really at, at risk. So, uh, you know, there's a background level of immunity that a very highly vaccinated country like the UK has, um, and also very now very highly exposed. So I think, you know, me, most of us have probably had three doses and a large majority Omicron exposure by now. Um, and so that that's definitely going to increase the barrier to severe disease and also um, future variants is, is going to put a heavy immune pressure on, on the next one that, that arrives. Eric, you had a question? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Emma. That was a, a great talk. It's great work. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is um, when you when you define first week of the pandemic, um, there were sort of two categories of folks, the ones that had un, had traveled internationally and then the others that you defined as community transmission. And I'm wondering for the people that were um, categorized as community transmission, were you able to track down whether they had contact with an international traveler or is that by definition something you weren't able to do? And if so, yeah. if not, can you estimate when the, when the actual week one of, of, of yeah. the pandemic began in the UK? So um, we were not able to identify whether it, we, we lost track um, in those initial weeks of uh, contacts. So we weren't able to say those people had necessarily had a contact with someone who had traveled, but we were able to say that they hadn't traveled. Um, this is actually also, I should say, it's Scottish data that, that um, I presented there and uh, the picture may have been a bit different in England. Um, now, the... Uh, we did do some dating. Uh, it wasn't, a, you know, probably not 100% reliable, but we used molecular clock dating to see when we thought that the emergence was likely to be um, in Scotland. And I, I, it looked like it was mid-February, um, mid-February, so two weeks before it was detected, um, and not a lot longer than that. And um, in England, it will have been very slightly earlier. Okay. And uh, the other question is, well, the other two questions, I don't want to take everybody's time, but um, can you just very quickly comment on two things? Um, what are the plans for the sequencing in the UK moving forward? And um, can you say something about the rate of, of, of emergence of new recombinants um, based on the data that you have so far? Yeah, um, so... The sequencing in the UK is going to massively decrease because we're doing an awful lot less testing already. Um, and so the investment that we have had in sequencing is going to markedly decrease. And uh, so countries that are doing more um, may want to uh, <laughs> may want to be aware that, you know, looking at UK data will become less sort of, um, uh, I don't know, less full than it has been. We will continue doing um, randomized sequencing and sampling. Uh, the, the extent to which that's going to happen is actually not 100% clear at the moment. In Scotland, the, the, the estimate is that we will do around 5,000, up to 5,000 sequences per week, but that might change over time, depending on, on funding availability from the government. Um, but I think you'll see a substantial drop, from the unfortunately, from the UK. Hopefully, we can start do it, being a bit more intelligent about our sampling and um, make sure that we have very well selected randomized samples, both from the community and hospitals and not just hospital based sequences. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have full power over what happens with that. <laughs> um, we'll just have to see what's what's possible. And then um, the new combinants. So I believe that we're down to at least XS at the moment in terms of recombinants that, that have been detected. Um, and they are emerging it would seem more rapidly, but I think perhaps we've been getting re recombination all through. It's just that the genomes have always been kind of similar. And if, if things are swapping around, you wouldn't really notice. Um, so I suspect that recombination, that's my guess, uh, that it's been ongoing at a similar we, rate we have because to, uh, we haven't 